he should uh, he should grow a beard because maybe he could get the, the people to vote for him that would uh, that would help him out. active 
uh, historical societies that existed in the state's 92 counties. By 1925, 65 Indiana counties were both societies. So you can see what started to happen. From the early 1900s to the 1920s, people started realizing that we have local history that we want to complement. But John Englehart founded the Southern Indiana Historical Society in January 1920. And from a small beginnings, the organization eventually grew to over 500 members from all walks of life and from all across the nation. And three times a year, for nearly two decades, they came to Southern Indiana to hear historical papers read by Southern Indiana Historical Society members. And our society was primarily interested in the fact that Lincoln biographers had neglected his years in Indiana. The group signed Articles of Incorporation for a nonprofit tax free organization. And they elected Inglehart to be president, and they adopted three loose objectives to study, preserve, and to publish history. When the name of the society prompted a debate, and Inglehart proposed that we should be called the Lincoln Club. The state officials rejected it because it was too vague. So then he decided on Southern Indiana Historical Society. But that name had already been taken by a group in New Albany, so at last he settled on Southwestern Indiana Historical Society, a name that would be shorted among his members as simply the Southwestern. Englehart also recruited specific members who would actively perform research and participate in the society, much like we do today with our board members, board of directors. He aimed initially for about a half a dozen people who were being active at the beginning but they would be able to interest a couple dozen of our best people to get them started in the organization. And some of the leading members included Richard Spam, Albion Fellow Bacon. What a wonderful woman. Albion Fellow Bacon, first of all, was a cousin of John Engelhart. Was it Engelhart or Engelhart? Engelhart. Yeah. 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 It, it's yeah. Freudian. <laughs> because all through my study, I kept thinking, please don't say Engelhart. <laughs> It's Freudian. I'm telling you, I've been psychology for years, and I'm telling you, what's in the back of your mind will eventually come out. So, I part, John, I part. Thank you. Instead of on the bottom, right? So anyway, that's how we settled Bacon. And I'm telling you, if you study any any uh, any on history, she is first of all, she's cousin to I part. She's a local reformer. She's the director of the National Housing Association. And she was also referred to as Indiana's municipal housekeeper. What an absolutely wonderful individual. And, and we do obviously presentations on this. Uh, the next one was Thomas D. Hunt, Thomas D. Hunt uh, who was a son of a Civil War major. And he inherited enough money from his family so that all he did in that job, all he did was study local history. And I don't want to kind of sway anybody, but he was quite the character. I'll stick with that. Uh, if you don't have a job and why you do study history, you can be rather uh, eccentric, I say. How's that? <laughs> uh, the next one is probably one of the most known individuals is George Horney. And uh, George Horney at the time was a sculptor, and he's done many Lincoln sculptors. In fact, we'll talk about him in Rockport. But what I didn't know is he's also a classically trained pianist. Uh, the next is Bess Ehrman. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, but I had to that there for you. This is George Horney. Guess who that is, David? That's your father. <laughs> so this is George Horning speaking to Dr. Morlock, the founder of our association in 1954. And I thought, how could you produce that picture? <laughs> <laughs> somebody from the original Lincoln Inquiry and now somebody from our modern day society. So this is the joint between the two. Next person is Bess Ehrman. And you can see, unfortunately, sometimes you have to take newspaper pictures and it becomes very pixelated. I'm telling you what again, she was quite the character because she's the one who wrote the pageants, she's the one who wrote the historical sketches, she's the one who did all the, uh, the, the, the theater type of productions, and she created quite a, uh, quite a stir when she created, when she uh, made a uh, pageant in her Rockport that was pretty phenomenal and included well over hundreds of people in the cast. Now, if anybody's in theater, hundreds, a hundred people in the first cast hundreds and hundreds in the second cast. And how you coordinate that, only she can imagine. The next person is, uh, this is uh, uh, Louis Ersay, who was a PhD, he taught at IU. He was the editor of the Indiana Magazine of History. And finally, the last person I want to mention on the picture of is Eldora Minor Minor. And 
And she was the niece of John Breckenridge. If you follow Lincoln, John Breckenridge was the one who gave Lincoln all his books. And supposedly, he's the one that Lincoln, that Lincoln got the book wet, and he went back, gave the book back to him, and said, I'll, I'll pay you for what, uh, what I've done to it. So these individuals were the, uh, the, the starting lineup of our uh, society. And we also had at least eight members of the society that owned or edited local newspapers in the area. And the papers and the communities published announcements and invitations and programs for each program. And they also invited members of the paper to regularly attend our proceedings. I know I counted three times that we were in the paper. So if you are not a member of our society, we highly recommend that you join. It's seven dollars. Two dollars for a lifetime membership. Two. Seven dollars for the year. So we have seven programs. We do one dollar program and seven dollars a year. And we invite anybody and everybody as, as a Lincoln Inquiry to contribute. So the former director of the Indiana Historical Commission, John uh, Oliver, wrote the Bible card, ma'am. And he said, Every time I tune in with your point of view, I find myself waxing enthusiastically over the whole, whole subject matter. And how I wish I could come in and spend more frequent time with you in contact and catch up with more of your burning enthusiasm. So again, you look at that man, and you look at Lincoln's eyes, and look at that man's enthusiasm, what an awesome opportunity. Over the course of two decades, our society eventually had over 500 members. It was post-tax surprise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. 40% uh, were men, 60% women, which is rather unusual because a lot of times men control, but our society here, the women also, uh, their interest rose from a, a desire to promote their local community. The Southwestern regularly hosted receptions and took pilgrimages to the local historical sites where members worked as guides and carried out costumes. Period costumes. Most significantly, society members prepared over 300 biographies of 369 of individuals and families, as well as local papers and cultures and institutions on local local areas. Thomas James De La Hunt. There he is again. Right, this, the, the difference between us and Vandenberg boils down to, to socialization. And it goes back to Thomas de, de, uh, de Leon. And he said, in order to increase the numbers, we must first uh, interest eligible people by entertaining them. <laughs> so not only do we give information, but we also have to entertain. So members of Southwestern could enjoy both serious historical preservation or presentations and also lighthearted socialization. The Southwestern Indiana Historical Society <coughs> provided the framework for hundreds of Hoosiers to do history together, and the meetings would bring together kindred minds from each county, forming thereby acquaintances, which would establish lasting friendships in the works of preserving local history that could be done through no other medium. And that's what John Engelhardt said. Preservation, publication, education, and outreach each found a place in the works of Southwestern. It saw both preservation and education as a means to correct the error perpetuated by past writers, particularly those who had written about Lincoln in Indiana. I don't want to explain. I don't want to explain. There we go. I don't want to explain that I come to the conclusion that the missing chapter in Lincoln's life in Indiana results from a substantial degree of the fact that it's a missing chapter in southern Indiana. Researching the southern Indiana's history would yield insight into Lincoln's experience and the history of the nation as a whole. And instead of sponsoring a dinner or founding a museum, the Southwestern would host at Lincoln Inquiry to carefully record and analyze family and community history in order to write a missing chapter in Lincoln's life. The endeavor would also correct the errors made by past historical writings. And some historians regard the southern Indiana folks to be ready for this hillbillies, <laughs> ignoramuses, Cheapskates, and I'm not going to say this, but damn skunks. That's what they said. <laughs> Ward Lehman, who distinguished Lincoln from uh, his, his other, who distinguished Lincoln from his future neighbors, said that Lincoln was a diamond flowing on a dumb hill. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see where it comes from. Michael Hart identified two problems with the biographers. First, he condemned the biographers as outsiders who spent only a short time in Indiana. And secondly, he challenged the prosecution's most important witness. Dennis Hanks. For he said Hanks was illiterate and an ignorant braggart who was entirely un unreliable. As a first step, members of the Historical Society responded to past interpretations by citing present authorities. And in 1921, Engelhardt, or excuse me, I go by, 
I love being a furrow. I will hard contact break this Frederick Jackson turn. Hey. Frederick Jackson turn. And Frederick Jackson Turner wrote a, a, a essay called Significance of the Frontier in American History, in which he said that as people move west, they establish their own identity, and that's the identity of America. So Frederick Jackson Turner was a Harvard professor who in 1993 wrote a famous essay titled The Significance of the American Frontier in American History. I got Hoosiers 
as mediocre at best. <laughs> so we're not asking for it. We're just saying, come on, we're not getting those. It's PJ. A local newspaper is on the society recognizes perhaps the leading historical society in research for the state of Indiana. And by early 1920, as the Lincoln Inquiry established an agenda and held its first public meeting, interest had grown. In the same year that the federal government finally unveiled its monument to dedicate to President Lincoln on the National Law. In November 1922, I got received a letter from the leading Lincoln biographer of the day. The day. No. Then go back. I no. No, this way up. Okay. No, no, no. You getting dizzy? Never be written by outsiders 
and that the historical material must be preserved by generations or will be lost. And Ida Terrell certainly agreed with the Lincoln in the inquiry. So one of the things they had was called the best witness. And the best witness said that if Lincoln is not here and there's nobody around that knew Lincoln, then the best witness is somebody who talked to somebody, or I guess a history source would be a secondary source. So the tide of reminiscence rose slowly after Lincoln's death and became a flood in the 1880s in Crescent and the centennial birth of 1909. The Lincoln Inquirer articulated a rationale for identifying the best witness available. And the Lincoln secretaries, there he is, uh, John Nikolai and John Hay became suspicious of reminiscence while working in the 1880s. And Senator Beveridge openly attacked both reminiscers and those who believed in the 1920. All three were openly skeptical of human memory. Were witnesses a part of the past that survived and changed into the present? Or did they simply create the memories to suit the past, to meet the present? William Herndon, He judged himself supremely qualified to present Lincoln in his passions just as he lived, breathed, and laughed. Herndon chose to employ witnesses as a window into the past that they themselves not, might not have fully understood. And as he put it, and his, as he, excuse me, reliant as he put it, his mud instinct, he wanted to see the men and women's faces when they talked, to read their motives, and thereby see to the gizzard. He thought that dusty documents from the past concealed too much. So Herndon stated, I didn't take down 100% of what was written. In fact, I didn't even take down 100th of what was written because I was not a stenographer and they talked too fast. The things which I did not deem of importance, I paid not much attention to. But now I regret it as now I've wanted very, as now I have often wanted the very things I rejected. I thought that if I should have a great advantage of personal conversation with Lincoln's contemporaries in regard to the important events of his life, but we ascertained from a very short experience that no confidence whatsoever could be attained by placing the memories of even the most intelligent or the most honorable men when it came to narrating the relations of the past. Because again, you can't trust human memory. The Lincoln Inquiry itself saw itself in the best position to soak in all the necessary details about the history of southwestern Indiana because they themselves had lived their entire lives among the places, the people, and the relics that survived from Lincoln's day. Among the society's records was one occasion an oral history performance. His name was John Shanklin Ramsey. Had joined the Union Army at, in Evansville at age 17. And before he reached, reached the field, a cannon ran over his foot, and he was reassigned to a provost guard duty in Washington, D.C. D.C. There, there we go. There, on April 14, 1865, he slipped away from his assigned duties to attend Fort Sear, and in the process, he became a witness to Lincoln's assassination. Discovering that Ramsey was the only known survivor of the local unit still living in our region, society members invited him to speak at one of their meetings, but age and ill health stopped him from presenting. On April 18, 1930, John E. Morlock, and I was asking Vivian, is John E. Morlock in relation to Dr. Morlock, interviewed the oxygen Terry and reported his findings to South Russia. So this is what he said. Booth jumped the rail of the box and sprang onto the stage. As he sprang to the stage, his spur caught the big American flag and he fell, injuring his leg. And I was in a position where if I had a gun, I could have shot him two or three times, but I had nothing. And I was in the theater without permission from my commanding officers. So I began to hastily retreat uh, and knowing that my immediate call would be sent out to my company. And as I went through the narrow lobby of the, of the theater, Lincoln's body was being carried out, and his head brushed my sleeve. And when I reached my barracks, I found my coat sleeve was covered with the president's blood. By reporting their actual experiences with interviewers, the interviewees became the witness to the past. And by drawing together many people interested in interviewing witnesses to the life and death of Abraham Lincoln, the Lincoln Inquiry created a community of practice who had been unavailable to isolated biographers. I go hard. All right. I go hard to see that all the new persons available in the past who have interviewed men and women who knew Lincoln have died. The interviewees may have passed on, but the interviewers 
martyrs remain available. To give us a description of these people with a view to show that they were respectable class of people. By encouraging and assigning hundreds of people to pursue questions about local and family history, the Lincoln Party sought to produce a rich history of Southern Indiana that would provide a proper context and a perspective for understanding Lincoln's youth in Indiana. Ida Terrell advised that we should trace and authentically establish the intellectual, social, and religious conditions of Southwestern Indiana in order to create an authentic picture of the atmosphere in which Lincoln lived. By the time the Lincoln Inquiry was organized in 1920, there were already two interpretations of the 16th president's early life. One was called the Dumb Hill. The Dumb Hill thesis emphasized the crudeness and the barbarianism of the frontier to depict that Lincoln, as a poor, illegitimate son of a shiftless, lazy father and illegitimate, Ill, uh, illegitimate delivered mother. The Shin Fai thesis emphasized the benefits of the delight of a frontier life to depict Lincoln as a child of nature who gained priceless wisdom and experience in Indiana, and that Indiana made Lincoln the man of the people. So you've got two different theories, and, and, and literally, they argued about absolutely everything. So you had the idea that Lincoln came from absolutely nothing, and the idea that, that by Lincoln going up to southern Indiana, that made him who he was. Instead of categorizing all, set, all settlers as either civilized or scum, the Lincoln Inquiry recognized the distinction of class, and Lincoln was simply a good representation Southern Indiana style. The Lincoln Inquiry invented and invited any substantial contribution to anyone who was able to offer it. And often formal presentations would prompt a memory or reminiscence that was recorded by the, social, by the society's stenographer. And the value of the evidence of this kind may be greater or less. As Engelhardt explained to Terrell, some of it is of supreme value. All of it has probative value, and a good deal of it has circumstantial evidence. And Albion's fellow Bacon wrote, the untold sources of historical wealth have not been reached, and that could be discovered and sorted out through diligent work. Speakers illustrate their talks with artifacts, and sometimes describe their excitement by finding things as tingling nerves and breathless, and, uh, breathless eagerness. Also, after Lincoln's death, it's amazing how many things have started to appear. So it seems that objects connected to Lincoln turned up everywhere after his death. Cabinets allegedly made by Lincoln and his father, Rails split by the team, brick bowls used by the hired laborers, the grindstone used to sharpen his axe, a knife with his initials carved in the handle, a kettle, pieces of gravel are all souvenirs. The interviewees with elderly residents also produced numerous stories about young Abraham Lincoln's life, love life. William Herndon identified three girls that may have stirred Lincoln's soul when he was living in Indiana. Ida Terrell added the fourth. And other biographers added a fifth. The interviewees reported the Lincoln Inquiry added an additional seven people who could have had a part of Lincoln's life. And these were read. Abraham Lincoln had carried Elizabeth Tooley's books. Nancy Beard had gone to an apple peeling and corn husking party with Abraham Lincoln. Polly Richardson had recalled that Abraham Lincoln had saved her and her mother from a pack of wolves with his axe, though by 1920 it proved impossible confirm whether the eight-year-old boy could have possibly done that. <laughs> One local woman who was caught smoking a corn cob pipe and leaning her chair against the wall was asked about Lincoln's girlfriends. And Miss Lugans replied, first of all, she removed the pipe from her mouth and said very quietly, I could have been Abraham Lincoln's wife if I wanted to. Yes, sir. I could have been the first lady of the land. <laughs> so when you start talking to it, you start to see there might be some problems with the truth. <laughs> so if there's a downfall of Lincoln Inquiry, unfortunately, it's when you're not talking to the primary source, you're talking to a secondary, secondary source, they might not remember properly. So the Lincoln Inquiry's method of collecting and compiling the research sought accuracy in the long run, but misinformation sometimes was stated as fact. At a society meeting in Gentryville in June of 1928, Thomas Dale Nunn announced in the past 48 hours Perry County residents had discovered an affidavit from 1866 in which a Jacob Weatherall Jr. testified that he and his father carried the Lincoln family across the Ohio River from Kentucky to Indiana in 1816 on his ferry at Clover Creek. This was later to found out to be a fabricated story. By the second half of the 1920s, Lincoln Inquiry had begun to turn heads with Lincoln biographers and historians. In 1925, Ida B. Terrell wrote, 
that she was becoming more and more interested in the Lincoln Inquiry, and the longer I roll over the idea in my mind, she wrote, the more convinced I am, not only that this is the right approach to study any Lincoln in southern Indiana, but it's probably a much wider and richer field than any of our biographers have yet appreciated. Uh, the next thing is probably one of the most controversial things in the entire Lincoln Inquiry, and it has to do with, with Nancy Hanks Lincoln and the Ku Klux Klan. Imagine that, Ku Klux Klan and Lincoln, and there's a, there's a connection here. So the, the Erickson, Keith Erickson, who wrote the book, uh, Everybody's History, wrote, on the rounded crest of a small tree-covered southern Indiana hill in Spencer County, by the buried remains of Nancy Hanks Lincoln, the mother of the 16th president. After succumbing to milk sickness, the chemical toxin transmitted to humans who drank the milk of cows that had grazed on the white snake root plant. Nancy was buried in a wooden box built by her husband with the likely assistance of her nine-year-old son. So that's that's been was written. In September 14, 1865, exactly five months after Abraham Lincoln was shot, his former law partner, William Herndon, visited the grave of Nancy Hanks Lincoln. And he found the trees and the undergrowth had become dense. And he found no fence, no headstone, only a sunken spot in the ground where a grave existed. For decades, the state of Indiana had mounted only a minimal attempt at carrying from the grave of Nancy Hanks Lincoln. And humble pioneer cemetery had been largely forgotten in the 19th century. In 1879, Peter Studebaker, who was the vice president of Studebaker Automotive Company, paid for a tombstone, and the residents of Rockport contributed the cost of putting a protective fence around the grave. So from, from 18, basically from when she died to 1879, there was nothing there. In the 1880s, the Lincoln government rejected an appeal to Southern Indiana and Hoosiers to assume this, the care of site, so they organized a private organization that secured $1,000 from, uh, from a Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, to erect an elaborate memorial stone to be carved from the discard stones of the memorial from his Lincoln's, or from his father's tomb in Springfield, Illinois. So they, they put this up. If you go down to our, our exhibit down at the museum, you can see this picture. In fact, they have a piece of the fence that's actually down there, which is awesome. And look what they did. They put this outrageously, I'm not going to say tacky stone in front of a grave, but that's not there anymore. Because they decided that, that was not part of the uh, that was the part of the it was overwhelming. <clears throat> so after years to see, so Robert Todd Lincoln erected the, the stone and he took the tomb, this stone, from the discarded stones from his father's tomb in Lincoln, or in Springfield. In 1907, Indiana's General Assembly assumed responsibility for the site and appropriated funds to erect an iron fence around the property and to build a road for the highway. And for reasons left unexplained, they were to install life-size sculptures of lions at the entrance. <laughs> after, after years of inactivity, and upon hearing rumors of the grave's deplorable condition, and rumor that the picnic party were desecrating the grave site, Richard Lyman, who was the director of the Indiana Department of Conservation, decided to close the park to all automobile traffic and prohibit all meetings except those that were explicitly religious and moral functions. And he had no idea what was going to happen when he closed that park. Because the people of southern Indiana, they erupted. They said, you can't do this. By the summer of 1926, the funds to allocate the states had been all spent, leaving no money to enforce the park's closure. And Liber wondered how could he persuade the state to, to allocate or raise more money for the tomb. Well, two years earlier, during the election of 1924, the Ku Klux Klan had overrun Hoosier politics. And the Hoosier plan grew to include, some say, one quarter of the Hoosier population, which was more people than the Methodist Church in Indiana. So you had more Klan members than members of the Methodist Church in 1924. So the national organization made its headquarters in Indianapolis, where its leader, Grand Dragon D.C. Stevenson, uh, coordinated national activities through the publications of national newspapers that singled out enemies, that identified Klan friendly businesses that endorsed political candidates. The Klan was particularly successful in Indiana 1924 election, sweeping into power as a gubernatorial candidate, Ed Jackson, and we'll talk about him in a minute, and also every other state representative on the ballot. So in 1924, basically every Ku Klux Klan member that was on an elected ballot got elected. And this is in Indiana. This is not Georgia. This is not Mississippi. This is Indiana. In March 1925, Grand Dragon Stevenson assaulted and raped an Indiana woman who then took poison and killed herself and died in April. 
By November, Stevenson had been convicted of second-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison, and the Klan's formal organization withered quickly. Well, Weiber saw this as an opportunity, and the result legacy of local racism and statewide shame, if Indiana's reputation had been blackened by the public sin of racism, and could it not be made restitution, could not be made better by erecting a tomb or a tribute to the Hoosier boy who became the great emancipator. And by December 22nd, 1926, Governor Jackson established a proclamation which was written by Richard Lieber declaring Indiana's desire to pay off the debt of a long standing which people of our state owe to the memories of the greatest American whose life in the formation stage of his youth was spent in Indiana, Abraham Lincoln. The proclamation named officers and executive committee and also put 125 ladies and gentlemen who were the who's who's of Indiana history to support the formation of the Indiana Lincoln Union or the ILU. The list also included 10 of our members, of which included uh, IR, Coleman, and also uh, Senator Beveridge. In February 1927, Governor Jackson declared, it is fitting that on the birthday of her son, we should dedicate ourselves to the duty of erecting on the grounds where she lived and died a monument or memorial of our appreciation. The most capable designer of the memorial was a gentleman named Frederick Law Olmsted. Now, I know that doesn't mean anything, but Frederick Law Olmsted designed Central Park in New York City. So here we go. We've got the designer of New York City Central Park coming to Indiana to design a memorial dedicated to Nancy Hanks Lincoln. His son did it. His son did it. His son did it. He got credit. <laughs> Uh, in, in my research, he got the other one guy. Right? Same research, junior guy. Right? Then, let me see here. Uh, it does say Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. In, 19, uh, in March of 1927, Olmsted drew plans that would combine ecological and commemorative elements. And he also proposed to restore the forest to give way to an open walkway that connected the grave site with a broad plaza featuring a colossal American flag. Olmsted proposed creating a sanctuary. Richard Liger's version was obviously different than Olmsted's plan. Liger had argued that the site's best purpose would not be as a playground or a picnic ground, but rather as a shrine. It was Indiana's duty and opportunity to hollow the ground where Lincoln spent his childhood and where his mother died. And Olmsted proposed offered a sanctuary for meditation so the ILU of Lincoln, uh, the Indiana Lincoln Union added to the original design a massive cathedral-like building. 200 square foot structure containing 150 <coughs> foot square tile and a large pipe order. With Olmsted's frontier forest, the ILU would further add a trail of 12 stones retrieved from places significant in Lincoln's life, such as his birthplace, his store in New Salem, his Illinois State Capitol. And winding through the gate of the Hoosier hardwood, this trail provided an explicit connection between the passions of Jesus Christ as commemorated in the 12 stations of the cross in the Catholic liturgy. And if you've ever been to the park, they do have an awesome trail that goes through there. And, and, and when you walk through there, you can't help but think, this is the area of Lincoln he grew up in. The site would perpetuate not only a Lincoln spirit as it existed in him, but it would also influence upon their own lives. From history to honesty, from sight to spirituality, from trees to tolerance, Liger made the, the leap of faith that Lincoln and his mother could, could atone for the sins committed by the Klan. Cal, uh, let me see, Cal Coolidge, there we go, Cal Coolidge endorsed the project and stated that if Indiana had earned a shameful reputation from being a place where modern mothers, mothers raised Klansmen, then certainly the time had come for them to be known as a place where the mother who raised a great emancipation. And the Lincoln Inquiry nevertheless questioned the pioneer monument for the, for the mother. They saw no use for the redemptive mother to atone for the sins of the entire state, and they preferred instead a memorial to the frontier boy who could typify the experiences and the attributes of all their ancestors. The Lincoln Inquiry did not challenge the interpretation of Lincoln as a great emancipator, but its workers differed from civic leaders in locating the source of Lincoln's greatness and the collective environment of the frontier rather than a singular mother. And I will our our politely explain to Turner that there had been an overemphasis on Lincoln's mother that would obscure the significance of Lincoln's experience in the Indiana frontier. And Turner wrote, Your society, the work of which I may follow with interest and 
prophet does well, in my opinion, to study the life and the condition of the pioneer folks of the regions that gave birth to Lincoln and to the Indiana Society, which influenced his formative years. Armed with Turner's authority with authoritarian endorsement, Lincoln inquired was ready to challenge the channel, challenge the Indiana Lincoln Union. And if you've been there, I don't think you see that great big cathedral like piece. And so you can see basically how the Lincoln Inquiry influenced the state not to do something like that. Throughout the decades of the 1920s, the Lincoln Inquiry took a message to the American people in a variety of ways. In time, the participants of the Lincoln Inquiry synthesized their findings so the public, by designing the public historical, build, historical building, by creating a photo exhibit, posting pageants, experimenting with film, taking students to local archives, and writing for scholarly and public readerships. They believe the past is conceived not as something lifeless in need of memorization, but rather something that needed to be encountered with energy. And the Lincoln Inquiry Road became one of welcoming the public into the place where it had never been, but where it was grateful to arise. And it was explained, we do not want to live in the past, but we want to make the past live in the present. We want to drink in the historical atmosphere and thereby be absorbed so much in Lincoln and his life as to feel a part of the early settlers. And before Albert Beveridge, uh, when he, he published his book, Abraham Lincoln, 1809, 1858, was published, Engelmark circulated a copy of uh, the first chapter two among the Lincoln Inquiry Able Workers. And when the published volume came out in September 1828, Southwestern listed six objectionable statements within the first, page, first four pages span and cast Lincoln's neighbors as men and women who were ignorant, rough-mannered, vividly suspicious, consumers of incredible quantities of whiskey and tobacco, and inclined to chewing, smoking, snuffing, and corncob pipe puffing. <laughs> in, public, in public, society expressed anger at the challenge beverages work, and they stood up in defense of their ancestors who could no longer speak for themselves. Speaking at a society meeting in June 1928, uh, Berman stated, as if it makes my blood boil to read the articles that historians have written that we were scum on the earth. She denied that her grandmother had drank whiskey or ever smoked a pipe, and others refused to allow their ancestors to be thrown in masses into the ranks of drunken plowmen and women of uncertain morality. George Loney uh, said, instead of being excited and abusive, we ought to state the facts and deal with the controversy in a humorous, quasi-sarcastic vein, which the facts may justify and grant all the time all the merits and good things that may be said in favor of Senator Beveridge in his lifetime. He said the best antidote for Beveridge's poison would be to publish the findings of the Lincoln Inquiry. So the Inquiry began working on a historical pageant and also reconstructing a historical village in Rockport. The pageant tied the story of Lincoln's youth to a spot on the Ohio River from which he set out on a flatboat journey to New Orleans in 1828. The village attempted to bring all of Lincoln's frontiers experiences into a single site in the community of Rockport. As a high school drama teacher, Airman wrote the pageant when Lincoln went flatboating from Rockport, and it was performed in the fall of 1826 with a cast of approximately 100. In 1828, the city of Rockport spent $700 to install circus seats and Airmen, or Ehrman, swelled the cast to well over 400, and the performance date was moved to the fall on July 4th. For she hoped the production would bring about worldwide publicity, as she aspired to give a true, honest picture of the pioneer life in Indiana, in dress, in properties, in every detail. She said, Kentucky gave him birth, Illinois gave him political career, but Indiana molded the man. Ehrman cast numerous descendants of the roles of their ancestors to make the production, in her words, the real history repeat. And the press releases a living memorial to America's greatest citizens. When ancestral ties were not available, in the case of Lincoln, she cast an actor who was a descendant of someone who knew Lincoln. In the further clues of, of historical synchronization, the pageant was set on the banks of the Ohio River, and the actors uh, actually launched a boat into the river as part of performance. The audience sat facing southward so the river in Kentucky Hills would form a natural background to the performance. In order to bring, bring the event to the widest possible audience, Ehrman's friends tirelessly worked to have film uh, distributed and the motion picture created. And it 
is hinted that D.W. Griffin and John Ford might be interested in producing a film on Lincoln, and the membership grew quite excited. <laughs> However, in 1930, D.W. Griffin released his own talk to Abraham Lincoln, but it ignored Indiana's history with Lincoln's life. The film debuted at a meeting in the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society in February of 1931 in a man in southern Indiana and a movie house in the schools for years. The pageant at Rockport bore several limitations in terms of reaching an audience because the stage was going to on stage once every two years. So in 1933, George Horning and his wife moved to Rockport where they worked to create 11 log buildings that would create a pioneer village for Lincoln's era on a four-acre site donated by the city. Construction began in 1934, and 10,000 visitors celebrated the village's opening on July 4th, 1935. The Lincoln Pioneer Village was designed as a memorial not only to Lincoln, but to the pioneer neighbors. The village contained recreations of Lincoln's family's last cabin and the home of Sarah Lincoln, occupied there by her uh, occupied after her marriage uh, to Aaron Grisby. Government reports and newspapers covering the promotional materials all emphasized that the village attention to detail was painstakingly exact and accurate to detail. The Lincoln Inquiry Project continued to receive the praise of contemporary writers in history, and the Indiana historian James Woodward endorsed the inquiry's conclusion that to consider Southern Indiana pioneers as inferior or outlandish folks, steeped in ignorance, illiteracy, boorishness, immorality, degradation, and crime could not be farther from the truth. And I B. Terrible judged that the Lincoln Inquiry had made an invaluable contribution to our knowledge of the conditions under which Lincoln and Boyd lived. As its influence grew, the society was approached by school districts requesting to train teachers in ready-made lessons outlined for class use. And George Wilson, himself a former teacher and superintendent, believed that modern education methods generally undermined the interest in history. And he humorously observed that when he was a boy at school, history was the driest subject on the planet. He was sure that the island that, that Noah's dove found should be called history because it was the only dry spot for the entire flood. <laughs> Southwestern complained that students were being taught to repeat answers but not to think and initiate, and the jar of memory was crowded when the think box was empty. The trouble with history is that too much is taught and not enough is learned, and the child is stuck with data and not fed. They bypass the classroom and the curriculum and push the school teachers send their classes out to do some real first-hand history work, and they urge teachers to take their students to Nancy Hanks Lincoln's grave or to Horning's Pioneer Village. It's so much easier to get our children interested in the study of county history, she said, if they can really see and examine these things. And field trips and archival research immerse the students in traces of the past that would encourage them to write up their findings. In 1930, however, several members of the society sparred with William Lynch, who at that time was the new editor of the Indiana Magazine of History, after he criticized their work and their ancestors. And these interpersonal difficulties were compounded by financial straits. I will hire found funded the society's activities for the first three years, and dues kept the flow during the second half of the 1920s. But after 1931, membership and dues uh, pays dropped dramatically. In 1932, the society's bank account was 32 cents. I will said that these last Lincoln Inquiry papers would never be published by the state. <coughs> And the Lincoln Inquiry might have survived the financial crisis had it not been for another catastrophe, and that was the death of its members. By 1933, the Society had dropped three of its original meetings and ceased to take stenography notes, and two years later, the members moved to one meeting annually, and by 1939, the meetings were reported to cease altogether. The Lincoln Inquiry, whose mission was to take the findings to the public, and they both succeeded and failed. It succeeded in mobilizing over 500 Americans to participate in the historical inquiry and in recovering archival and oral sources. And the Lincoln Inquiry likewise inspired the interest of uh, other hundreds of Hoosiers. But the Lincoln Inquiry failed to produce a lasting synthesis of public consumption. The photo exhibit and the pageant were received at first, but they were also transitory. The village provided employment and drew crowds, but enthusiasm diminished with time. Eight months after John Engelhardt, Engelhardt's death, James Randall called for the banishment of amateurs from the field of history, and that was the end of the Lincoln Inquiry in 1939. So, what a wonderful uh, opportunity that Southwestern had to create.
create these, these 369 pieces of evidence chronicling uh, Southern Indiana history. So, I'll entertain any questions if you have them. Just one comment. Yes, sir. I was at the opening of that Lincoln Temple. <laughs> I was six years old. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. I remember them having a, a, a Indian war. The Indians invaded and they had me shot. <laughs> oh my gosh. See, the beauty of history is you were there. You're getting there. I remember that. Places and, and it was a big thing to go every 
three months or whatever right. they did, and, and they had dinner provided, and then they go on tours of whatever was in the area. So it was. Well, it was they said the first one had ten thousand people, and then fifteen thousand people, and then twenty-five thousand people for the pageants. Yeah, twenty-five thousand. Yes. We can't get. I mean, twenty-five thousand. And again, it's on the river. So how how awesome would that be to actually watch? The pageant where they actually launched the boat, set Lincoln up on his 1828 trip. And so one last thing. Yes, sir. My grandfather's name is Albert Beveridge Langford. So he was, he was born in 19, <laughs> 1906. So I never knew how he got the name, middle name of Beveridge. And he always went by Beveridge. He never went by his first name. Uh -huh. So the only thing that I could come up with was that he was named after Senator Albert oh, yeah. Beveridge. Gosh, what a great story. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as a teacher, and anybody who ever teach, I mean, that's what you realize. The beauty of teaching is hearing these stories. And when you tell kids, I mean, I, I keep, I've been teaching history for a long time, and then I'm sure that kids will say it's very dry. And the beauty is putting personal into it. His, in fact, Terry, you, you didn't teach me, but you helped reinforce it. History is people. It's not events. The events happen because of people. And so when you hear about, you know, your ancestors, how could you not be enthusiastically and go, I gotta find more stuff about it? So, what, what a wonderful opportunity. Anybody by the I mentioned you earlier, uh, what kind of uh, material do you have at Central as far as the software? We have some of the, uh, like the write ups of the speeches and some of the things that were, were presented at the uh, inquiry that was, um, and a handful of papers. Right. And all that is yes, sir, you had a question? Um, I've gotten more off for several classes at the University of Evansville, right as he was about to retire. And the story of the Civil War veteran in the fourth year, and they quote Don E. Moore off there. What relationship was he to Dr. Dean? That's, it, and that's, that's what I asked him. And I, I don't know. He had an Uncle John. I, I don't know that he had a middle initial, and I don't know that he was active in local history because that person moved to St. Louis. Well, I'm wondering if that was James that brought him um, to the historic society. I'm and they got the name wrong. That's what I'm wondering. I will say, in history, that, 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 that happens a lot. I mean, well, initial is even more painful. Right. Because my first is a presentation for PowerPoint. One thing I was going to do, I was going to give you the freshman history PowerPoint. And that means that if you find anybody named anything, you put their picture up there. And it's like, that's not Senator Beveridge. Well, I looked it up on the internet and it said Beveridge. It's like, no, 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 no. You need to do a little more research, so a lot of times it might not be right. I have a newspaper clipping from Dr. Morlock, Meyer, by 1971. Mm -hmm. I need more copy of the part of his Like his whole, his whole history is something else. Well, when I first joined the society in the late 1980s, I can't tell you enough, I'm living in here, I can't tell you enough I was influenced by Dr. Morrow because he was a society, he made it happen, and he was the energy, and he brought the people in. And so, from Dr. Morrow, retired as president, we went through a society where our presence changed every, was it every three years we in? Until me. <laughs> so I've served seven terms, and I, and I go back to, first of all, what Dr. Morrow's philosophy was, to reinstitute the local history and to emphasize our, our heritage. You need a story to <laughs> Vivian told me that. Or Sam told me. Well, they told me that he would start a class with a piece of chalk. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, this chalk was everything that's going to go on that board, but you don't know anything. And he'd turn around <laughs> and start writing. And it's like, the piece of chalk knows everything. <laughs> and I thought, if I told my, my freshman that, that this pencil holds a good one, no, it's <laughs> fair. Uh, but, but yes, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes I look at my students like that, but their eyes are. Any other comments? What a wonderful opportunity this is, because I think again, this goes back to the origins of our society. And, and when our society stopped in 1939, after a road in after John Agarhart, Engel Agarhart died. <laughs> I wanted to continue 
And I saw what was happening. I was the youngest person involved. And look at our society. We, we you know, our, our people from EBSD keep coming to our teachers, coming to us and saying, you know, what are our teachers doing? And I can tell you how many EBSC teachers have been here in the 20 years that I've been president. And it's less than, I won't say it, but it's less than one hand to show you. I can't even name those five. Um, so we as, as a society have responsibility to keep this going. And so that's why we're doing our, inter our internet page. And Jennifer, thank you for taking care of that. And our board of directors, which we work really hard at putting these programs together that are going to emphasize the United our local history. And I can't thank you enough for our board because they are at, they're wonderful. And, and they have people from all different walks that contribute all different ideas. And to hear these ideas are awesome. And you'll notice that every year, one or two of us are going to raise a hand and go, I'll do a presentation. <coughs> that's what makes it exciting. I mean, anybody who does research knows that you cannot tell you, I can't tell you how many hours I put into this. I can't tell you how much time. I mean, it, it just takes time. But every minute, every hour that you work on it, you keep thinking, I cannot wait to share this with somebody. And that's what teachers do. They learn the material, and then they want to share it. And I think that, as society, that's what we should do. Yes, David. Hi, Rob. Great, great job. I just wanted to say also that this story is, a, a, I think, an inspiration to all of us to of the importance of amateur historians, people who are not necessarily trained as historians or people who don't do it professionally but do it because they, they love the topic. Um, and if you're one of these people, please keep doing what you're doing. And the second thing is the, the importance of talking to witnesses. Um, you know, the, the generations are passing, right? And, you know, Vivian has that direct connection, and this gentleman has that direct connection, and you have the direct connection to Dr. Morlock, but lots of us don't. But the, he lives on because you talk about him. But, you know, I, I think all of us have connections to people who live through amazing things, and I would certainly urge all of us to, to talk to these people and ask them and, and record it. It's never been easier to record that stuff than it is now. And, and you know, please, please do that because it's really important. And James right now is working on a, a PBS project uh, on World War II. Uh, I mentioned taking the kids to the history and John Carl at, at uh, Rice is doing a program called Field of History in which they create doc students who write the documentaries they edit it, they shoot it, they, they do everything in this panel of PBS. And you can go to Phil, go to YouTube, and type in Phil and History, and there's a pro, there's a 70, 80 programs that they created. And and uh, it is awesome. It's exactly what James is saying. It's kids taking it in their own pocket and saying, this is mine. I want to do this. I'm not being taught this. I want to teach you this. And that's what we all have. I mean, my gosh, the economy just paid about like your family. You know, if, if we didn't have this presentation, I would have never heard of it. Uh, the, the, again, you were there in 1935 and the on July 4th. And, and, and you talked already about trying to get history from people who have been there. Right. I see Mark Brown in back in the back. He and I are part of this uh, Freedom Heritage Museum. And we're running into the same thing. All of these guys that went through all this World War II stuff, they're all going away. Right. And we're trying to catch them. Where they get to for that. But we did, uh, James did a presentation, right? Uh, and then and then Mark, right. one of our speakers, did show up, and I can't thank you enough, Mark. Uh, he had his program in the can, and after 15 minutes, we plugged it in, and yeah. one, two, three, it's showtime, and what a great thing we had. We had James doing his presentation on World War II, and then Mark doing his presentation on World War II, and what an awesome opportunity. If you've never been out to the, to the airport during the summer to see the planes they bring in, it's well worth your experience. Now, no, this is not Lincoln Inquiry, but to walk through a B-17 and realize <laughs> and all these guys have been crazy. there are in their 90s now. And they're dying yeah. faster than you can with it. I mean, that, that's the sad part. I tell my students again, if you've got, I used to say grandparents, and now it's great grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage them to go through their stuff. One time I, I taught at Elfric. I don't know what I did. I taught a teacher at Elfric, and this girl came in and said, Spirit, I went through my, uh, my great grandmother's trunk, and look what I found. And it was a document signed by, I think it was President Buchanan, who's not my favorite, but it was a land grant, it was a land grant signed, by, signed by Buchanan. And she said, what's this worth? And I, you know, she was expecting thousands, and I said, you know, I don't really know what's worth. She said, a couple thousand dollars. I thought, oh, 
but she was so silent that she had it, and she met me at my door. I got her early. She met me at my door with this paper to live in the spirit. Check this out. And she was so excited, and, and I'm telling you, we all have those opportunities to go through our grandmothers, our grandfather's stuff, and to find documents, my papers, as James said, document, shoot it on your phone. <clears throat> it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity, and I'm telling you folks, if we don't do it, just like you said, it's not going to be there. And once it's gone, it's gone. And so, not like the Lincoln Inquiry, where you were interviewing people that interviewed Lincoln, these are people that were actually there, so you got the primary source. As a history teacher, primary source, primary source, primary source. You can't say it enough. Secondary source of our interpretations. And sometimes those interpretations just are not right. Yes, James. I also just wanted to say that it's very risky. Uh, I was talking to my son's fourth grade class yesterday about World War II, and I was all this little girl raised her hand and said, So you lived through World War II, what do you remember about it? <laughs> Anybody else? I, I, I would love to comment. Anybody else? Okay, so let's see. 